Thanks everyone for coming to a session about data after lunch. You must be really keen or really keen to fall asleep. Um, hopefully the former. Um, so this is going to be a talk around data, data visualization, examples of what I use in my organization, what I've seen used in other organizations, or generally things that I see used in the industry which I think are bad. Um, I work for ASOS, hopefully people know who ASOS are, we're an online fashion retailer. Um, for context, we have over 100 teams doing tens of thousands of deployments every month. And um, as coaches, we work in a framework agnostic way, so we're certainly not focusing on any particular scaling framework, all around values, principles, finding a way of working that's right for our context. Um, so let's kick off. So measurement is generally a bit of a divisive thing in the Agile world. Uh, some people may not be fans of it, um, often quoting this example from Goldratt of, tell me how you measure me and I will tell you how I'll behave. Um, so talking about the negative impact of data visualization, measurement metrics on human behavior. And another often quoted example is this from Peter Drucker of what gets measured gets managed. Um, and I think I've actually heard someone quote this in a talk today. Um, which is bad news for them because Peter Drucker didn't actually say this. Um, what he did say was something entirely different. And it's not quite as negative as the initial quote. Uh, and if you ever want to um, validate an agile coach quoting Peter Drucker, go to the Drucker Institute and look at did Peter Drucker say that? Because um, chances are it might reveal a thing or two. Um, and another one that I like looking at is Deming's quote of, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So let's try to use data in the conversations that we're having. And as a practitioner, I don't think data gives you the answer. I just think it gets you asking better questions. And data measurement, it's across the chasm for me with our industry. And a good measure in the Agile world, if something's crossed the chasm, is if there's a certification about it. Um, so chances are, if you see someone on LinkedIn with their initials after their name, um, they've probably been on one of these courses. And this may be a little bit harsh. I don't think these courses are necessarily bad. Um, so you've got the PMI one there with Disciplined Agile and Agile Metrics, uh, Scrum.org, Evidence-Based Management, and Pro Kanban's Professional Apply Metrics. So, I don't think these are necessarily bad because they're validating understanding, guiding people as to what to look at, what to avoid, um, but it's a good measure of something crossing the chasm in our industry when there's a certification. And another kind of sense check as to have we crossed the chasm is if there's an annual survey. So if there's a state of Agile, state of Agile coaching, state of Scrum, um, there's now an Agile metric survey. Um, so again, for me, that's a good measure as to has measurement become a popular idea? Has it become mainstream? Has it crossed the chasm? Now, talking of measurement, uh, a really good book that I'd encourage people to read is this by Alberto Cairo, How Charts Lie. There's Alberto on the screen looking very serious. And it's all around getting smarter with visual information. So the way that we visualize data, getting smarter about it, getting more informed about it. And when we talk about getting smarter with charts, we don't necessarily mean something like this. Uh, this is from the Times in June, back when uh, Boris Johnson was in power. Uh, most people probably thought it couldn't get worse than Boris, but look at what's happened in the past week. Um, and as you can see, we've got uh, Johnson to remain Prime Minister at 25%, preferring someone else as Prime Minister at 60%, but the bar's shorter, and even the 25% isn't the same as the bar below, so it's a mess. Now, this isn't kind of what we're talking about when getting smarter with visual information. This was just an encoding error, um, but it's a good example as to how charts can be publicized and actually they don't make sense. What we are looking at are charts like these. So this was under President Obama, came out from the White House when he was in power, talking about how more students are earning their high school diplomas than ever before. So this is great, hashtag lead on education, Obama's doing fantastic. 
But we need a little bit more context around that, and we need to improve the design. So this design is a little bit misleading. Um, as you can see, the value that it's starting at, with it being a percentage, should really be at zero. So it should look something like this. Now, it's not saying that Obama isn't having a positive effect, because more students are earning their high school diplomas than ever before. But when you compare the two visuals, the percentage increase isn't quite what we saw. And there's additional context needed, because you need to look at the past presidents. And what we can actually see from kind of early 2000 issues, it's been on the rise pretty much every year since. So is it a reflection of the president in power, or is it something wider in the system and just more people are earning their high school graduation? So be mindful that, you know, we need context when it comes to visualization. And visualization of data with politics is a very popular thing. Um, here we have the impact of the mayor in Alcacon, where we can see that with the current mayor, he is having a massive impact as the unemployment rate is dropping significantly compared to the previous mayor. That's not strictly true. Look at the time period we're using. So with the previous mayor, we're looking at a four-year period. With the current mayor, we're looking at a 12-month period. We're also missing two years' worth of data. And also, when you look at the values, the axes aren't the same. And what we need to visualize is something like this. And again, it's not saying that the current mayor isn't having a good impact, but it's giving you some context and perception as to well, what was unemployment really like, and how much has it actually fallen? And then the final example, and probably my favorite, of how charts lie is this one. And as you can see, we've got cigarette consumption for people above the age of 14 plotted against life expectancy in years. And for any smokers in the audience, you've got good news. Smoking cigarettes can help you live longer. Um, but again, that's not strictly true we need to consider the element of income within countries and be mindful that a chart shows only what it shows and nothing else. So don't necessarily take what you're seeing as the answer. You need the additional context. And why is that relevant to an Agile conference? Well, we need to think about the different ways that charts lie and what they mean for us. And Alberto details these five ways. So charts lie through bad design, uh, displaying dubious data, concealing or confusing uncertainty, uh, displaying insufficient data, not enough to make a decision or have a conversation, and suggesting misleading patterns. So these are the five ways that we're going to focus on how charts lie. And where you or your organization may be at right now is looking at measurement, or maybe you're doing this already, or maybe you're about to. Uh, Comic Agile is one of my favorites for referencing where various transformations I've experienced have gone on. And we're looking at measurements, so we want to measure the impact of what we're doing. We need to shift away from measuring output to outcomes. Uh, so it's really important that we look at some key metrics that maybe you've got a consultancy in and they've told you about. And we're going to start our journey by looking at a TV show. And it will have a link to Agile, I promise. Um, has anyone seen the TV show Dope Sick? Not a single hand in the audience, wow. So Dope Sick is all about the opioid crisis in America. So it's a drama. Uh, Michael Keaton is one of the main actors in it. And it's all around the opioid crisis and how it affected different aspects of American society. So people that were prescribed opioids, the doctors that were prescribing them, the salespeople that were trying to encourage the doctors to prescribe them, the pharmaceutical companies, the people investigating the pharmaceutical companies, all the people kind of in the ecosystem, and it's based on a true story. So I'd highly encourage, um, if you take nothing away from this talk, at least you've got a new TV series to watch. And uh, within kind of Dope Sick, one of the things that comes to fruition is how the salespeople have been using data to manipulate the doctors to overprescribe the opioids for patients. And uh, this chart is being explained by a data scientist here, where we're looking at the positive effects compared to other drugs of OxyContin. And what we can see from the axes here 
is the length of the bar from 10 to 20 is the same as the length of the bar from 40 to 100. So that's a badly designed chart, deliberately misleading. And you might think, well, this is a TV show. Was it actually true? Yes, here are some examples. Um, so that is that exact same chart that was used. We've also got uh, an inconsistent um, plasma level over 12 hours here. So again, we've got a log scale used to mislead. And it even got to the point where we're just not going to label the axes anymore and just say it's good. So these are all real examples. These were things that were actually used. And how does it link to agility? So here's a chart that I saw used in a previous organization. I won't say who. And they were looking at JIRA adoption, because JIRA adoption is clearly the measure of agility. And we're looking at the number of issues created per month versus the number of issues completed per month. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing to look at. You could argue this is arrival rate and departure rate. And it's looking at it cumulatively. So you want these going in the right direction. And that's what they look like. So we're all good, except there's a problem. And these charts lie by being poorly designed. What we can see is that the axes are not the same. And it's presenting a misleading story around our agile adoption. If we make them the same values, we start to see something different. And again, this isn't the best visualization because you could just screenshot one of those. So we need them on the same chart. And what we can see is this, that actually those lines are growing further apart. And that's the first appearance of my cat, Milo. And that was probably the face that I pulled when I saw this information. So actually, the rate at which we are creating things in our tool of choice is not matching the rate at which we're completing things. So guess what? Lots of things being created that ain't going to get done. Second chart, and apologies for anyone who is a fan of burn up or burn downs. It's not my intention to upset you, just to challenge your thinking. Um, here's a screenshot from Azure DevOps and uh, how to configure a burn down or burn up widget. And these are commonly used, and I'll admit, years ago I used these as well. But these charts lie. And these charts lie by confusing or concealing uncertainty. You might be thinking, how's that so? It's showing us what we want. Well, we're using the average completion rate, uh, the rate which we're finishing work and calling it our burn up or our burn down rate. And we're using that to forecast when we're going to finish. You can see by the projected completion there. Now, these are based on averages. Now, anyone who has read the book of Sam Savage, The Floor of Averages, will know this quote, plans based on average fail on average. So using average is at best tossing a coin. Now, when it comes to projecting an end date for delivery, I don't like to toss a coin, particularly if it's someone else's money. And the flow of averages is probably best explained in this simple visual. If you are interested in working at a company, someone might tell you what the average starting salary is. And then when you actually uncover a little bit more, you see it skewed by the massive outlier, which is the CEO's son's salary. So it's presenting misleading information. And when we look at our burn up or burn down, at best, these dates are 50% likely we're going to meet them. So anyone that's using that, that's the risk that you're taking on when you use this visual. And now you're probably thinking, well, what can we use? Can we even use anything? Well, we need to be mindful of um, why deterministic estimates, i.e. a single date for when we'll be done or what we'll deliver, they do not work because we work in the complex domain. And Dave's there in the front row, so hopefully I don't mess this up. Um, where you know cause and effect, it's not necessarily clear, and it's not as simple as using best practices. It's not as simple as if we follow this plan, we will meet this date. Things change when we look at things like burn up or burn down charts. Teams get pulled into production issues, team size changes, people go on holiday, the feature we're working on changes. There's lots of things that can go right and could go wrong. So using deterministic estimates for when we're going to finish is not the right way to go about it. And what we want to do is we want to think probabilistically, which is acknowledging that there are a range of outcomes that could occur. And if we look at the two approaches, at the top we've got our backlog size divided by our velocity, telling us we're going to be done in five weeks. 
And in the probabilistic approach, we've got a range of items that are in the backlog, because some things may come out of the backlog, some things may get added. This is about embracing change, after all. And we need to understand we have a range in terms of the things we complete. We don't necessarily do the same every single week, every single iteration or sprint. And you might be sat there thinking, well, this range is too wide. I can't possibly say four to 30 weeks to my stakeholders. And you're correct. So let's look at how we do this practically. So instead of a traditional burn down chart or burn up chart where we take a number divided by the other and project when we're going to finish, we actually do this lots and lots and lots of times, hundreds, even thousands of simulations of the future based on the past. And what this gives us is this kind of blue histogram visual here where we've got the range of outcomes that could occur, the potential duration that this piece of work might take. And you'll see in this visual, we've run the simulation 100 times. If you want to go and practice and play around with this for yourself, follow the link to Troy McGuinness's stuff, and it'll give you some insight as to how you can do it. And then what we move towards is thinking about the outcomes probabilistically and putting the onus on our stakeholders, the people consuming the forecast, as to how much risk do they want to take on. Do they want to take on 30% risk and go with something 70% likely? 85%, so 15% risk, or even is that too much of a risk threshold, and actually we need to go as low as maybe 5%. As you can see, when we move the bar, that changes the probability of a particular outcome occurring. And this is what we use with our teams at ASOS. So two kind of questions stakeholders want answers to are, when something going to be done? How long will it take? And here we've got percentage likelihoods attributed with the colors. And then in terms of if we have a deadline to work towards, because pretty much everyone has a deadline in mind, right? Uh, we can project how many backlog items we're likely to complete by a given duration. And this will evolve over time as and when we get new data, new information, rather than relying on kind of fortnightly status updates and everyone gets together at a project board and checks where we're, to go, where we're going. So this is what we need to do when it comes to thinking about duration and thinking probabilistically rather than deterministically. When it comes to agile and particularly flow, um, queues are kind of the enemy of flow. Uh, Don Reinertsen with a great quote here as to kind of the impact of waiting. And uh, Dominica de Grandis, the author of Making Work Visible, which is a fantastic book if you haven't read it, um, she talks about if you measure anything, measure wait time. So measure how long something takes. And what's become popular, um, evolved from the lean world of process efficiency, is flow efficiency. This is where we look at the actual time spent working on something divided by the total time, and we multiply that by 100, and that gives us our flow efficiency percentage. Um, here you can see a workflow mapped out and where the active states are, where the waiting states are for a particular team. And it's then visualized in a chart like this, where we look at the frequency of items that have a particular flow efficiency percentage, as well as looking at the average of our flow efficiency items. And this is, you know, a very popular thing. And lots of people say, well, if you measure nothing else, measure flow efficiency. Um, I'd like to challenge that notion um, because I think flow efficiency is an overrated, hard to calculate, and difficult and unpractical metric for people to adopt. And when anyone says it's the one metric you should track, take it with a pinch of salt. And that's because this chart lies by displaying dubious information. The first problem is that for a lot of teams, they don't have their wait states mapped. So in a workflow like this, everything is work, and therefore our flow efficiency will be 100. Therefore, it's not practical for us to apply. Now, maybe we do have our wait states mapped. Maybe we've got them plotted out here, and we can calculate you know, the percentage of time spent working on something. The next problem becomes the lack of real-time updates. When something happens, people don't immediately go to the board, not in my experience. So you get, for example, people saying things like this on uh, the daily scrum, daily stand-up. Oh, I finished that yesterday, but I forgot to move it. Or we actually started that on Monday. I didn't get a chance to move it. I was in workshops and meetings all day. And therefore, that skews our flow efficiency calculation. Therefore, the information is dubious. And what about being blocked? 
So when items get blocked, let's say, for example, this one that's in build, we can't progress it to the next step in our workflow. We're waiting on stakeholder feedback, and we've identified it as blocked on our board. A lot of the time, a lot of the literature that you'll read about flow efficiency, it completely miscounts that. It doesn't account for when work gets blocked. Here's an example from a popular blog where we've got our 10 days in active states. And in my experience, there is no way that all that time in those green sections, work didn't get blocked. Okay, Maybe they work in an environment where I haven't come across it yet in my years as a practitioner, but stuff gets blocked. When you're developing something, there is no way you are working on it that whole time. What about when you go home at the end of work? Do you mark it as blocked then? Of course not. You just keep it in progress, and therefore, the flow efficiency percentage is skewed. Problem four is uh, the concept of number wang. Now, if people don't know what dope sick is, there's no way they're going to know what number wang is. Uh, number wang is a sketch from a comedy show in the UK called that Mitchell and Webb look. Um, it's quite a few years old. There is a link there if you want to watch a video. And within the show, you have contestants, and they just shout out numbers, and the guest will then profess, that's number wang, um, with no real logic behind it. And sometimes you get people just kind of making up numbers and seeing if that's successful. Um, trust me, it's funnier than how I'm describing it. Um, and when it comes to flow efficiency, really, for me, it's number one. Okay? So something might have a flow efficiency of 19%. Something might have a flow efficiency of 9%. So what? It's just a number. It doesn't necessarily mean that that item that was 19% efficient was more efficient than a 9% item. Because even look at the cycle time, right? One had a much shorter cycle time, so from a customer, stakeholder, person wanting the features experience, which is going to be more efficient to them? Probably the item that got to them sooner. And then the final problem when it comes to flow efficiency, and Milo's making an appearance again, is when we aggregate it. So if you saw the chart before, we looked at our average flow efficiency. When we aggregate all that information up and we look at what that is, it can mask where we have problems or learning opportunities. So those top two items, what was it that caused them to flow so efficiently? And the three items that are in single digits, what blocked them? What caused them to slow down? And it doesn't tell us any of that information. And chances are, you probably know what the blockers are anyway. So always be mindful if you're using flow efficiency, these are some of the shortcomings with it. Now, heard cycle time mentioned in a few talks. And I think cycle time is generally a pretty good metric. So this is the amount of elapsed time in calendar days between when an item starts and when an item finishes. And we calculate that, and we look at you know, how long it takes for us to essentially finish work once we've started. And this is an example that I've seen in a previous organization where someone is coaching a team. And you can see by their badge there who they represent. And they've improved their way of working. And they have had a massive impact and reduced their cycle time. Great. Well, some things to bear in mind. For one, correlation doesn't equal causation. So just like if you're going to eat a lot of cheese tonight and then change your bed sheets, you probably won't die. But those two things are correlated. Doesn't necessarily mean that because the Agile coach has been working with them, that they've been the direct cause as to why cycle times improve. And I'm conscious I'm doing myself out of a job, but let's be honest. So you need to be careful when you use medium. Medium is a form of average. And again, simplistically, this person is trying to encourage their friend to invest with them, and the median gain of their fund is 8%. So that's great, but actually, when we look at the things on either side of the median, we have massive losses. So by missing that context, they may not be the right person to invest with. And if you go back to our chart, we're looking at the median cycle time per week, and it's trending down. And with the median, we have some items below it and we have some items above it. So we need to be mindful of that. And actually, this chart lies by suggesting misleading patterns. It's suggesting that cycle time is improving. It's reducing. Therefore, we're getting work done quicker. When we look at the full data set, a different pattern starts to emerge. And for people that can't quite easily tell, cycle time is increasing. 
it's not decreasing when we bring the whole data set into it. And as you can tell, Milo is less than impressed. So this is how we've suggested something that is somewhat dubious. It's actually quite misleading. Cycle time isn't improving. And I've seen more than one team make their decisions just based on what their average cycle time is. So again, be mindful of that when it comes to using this measure. What you should use um, is a cycle time scatter plot. Hopefully, some people are familiar with this. So each dot represents an item plotted against when it was finished and how long it took in calendar days to deliver. And then you've got these dashed lines here. They represent your 50th and your 85th percentile of your cycle time. So you can get a sense as to you know, your median, your, your 50th percentile, what your average is, and then your 85th percentile. So for the vast majority, how long do they take? This is great for quick identification of patterns and anti-patterns, so clusters, meaning we maybe deliver work in batches. Yeah, so we're not kind of having a steady stream, a continuous delivery of value. If we have gaps, like we do here, that means days when work isn't getting done, isn't getting completed, so we probably want to do something about that. And the worst case is when we have the triangle, like we saw in the data set before. That's where cycle time is increasing. Things are taking longer. So something preventive is needed as a team. Do we limit WIP? Do we focus on pairing? Do we do some mobbing? There is no single answer. It doesn't give you the answer, but it just gives you some insight as to where you might be looking to improve. And then the final thing that most people crave after is predictability. And when you look at your cycle time, if you have high variability in how long things take, that means you are less predictable. And if you have low variability, like on the right here, that means you're more predictable. So that means the way you're working is probably the right way to go about it. And finally, in terms of how charts lie, we're going to talk about leading and lagging metrics. Now, hopefully people know what these are. If you don't, uh, lagging metrics, basically they're kind of end state things that happen. So if you wanted to lose weight, how much you weigh would be your lagging metric. Leading metrics are things you can do and things you can measure to directly influence your lagging metric, hopefully positively. So if you wanted to lose weight, you might measure number of calories consumed, how often you went to the gym, uh, daily step count, a um, bunch of different things. And when it comes to agile, um, a lot of the stuff we've looked at, so things like cycle time, things like throughput, these are really lagging metrics. So what are the things that we can do to positively influence those? And one example that I saw mentioned at a meetup, um, I won't say who presented it, was looking at the average time in status. So this is looking at, of the items that are in progress right now, how long have they been in a particular status? And sorry for anyone that just took a picture of it, this chart lies. This chart lies by displaying insufficient data. It doesn't tell us how many items are there, or we're looking at the average for the items in a particular column. So let's fix that. And here we have the dots representing each item, and our dash line shows us our overall average. So here we can see we've got three items in testing, and some have been there a day, two days, three days. Great. We've now got our leading metric. Not so fast. Some of you might even use JIRA, and it will show you this. It will show you how long something's been in a particular column. And you might think, that's a really cool feature. It kind of is, kind of isn't, because this chart lies by displaying insufficient data again. It doesn't tell you how long things have been in progress, how long they started. And that's what our stakeholder, customer, consumer, the person requiring the thing, that's what their experience is. They don't care how long it's been in a particular column. They care about how long before they get it. So this item that's been our ready for development column for one day, it could have been in the previous column for 100 days and moved yesterday. We're masking that flow issue with this visualization. Similarly, so what? Things have been in a column for three days on average. How long have they been in progress? And how does this compare to our historical cycle time? The chart you should use is the work item age chart. So you can take a picture of this one. Um, each dot represents an item, and we're looking at how long it's been in progress plotted against the stage in the workflow it is at. And then we also have these dash lines that represent our historical cycle time in terms of our 85th and our 50th percentile. 
So this is much more handy for us when it comes to conversations about flow, potentially even using this in our daily scrum or daily stand-up, because this item that's above, the 85th percentile, this is now bigger than 85% of the work we've completed in the past. Do we need to do something about that? What do we need to do? Should we break it down? Is it just something we accept? It's gone past that line? I don't know. It gets you having a better conversation. Or maybe, should we be worried about these items? These are coming close to our 85th percentile, so chances are there might be something wrong with those, and we should be prioritizing those and working on them as a team, rather than maybe those items that are lower down in the chart. And ultimately, it shows us how does our current item age compare to our historical cycle time. And if you really want to get advanced with this, you can use this single item forecasting, using what's called a service level expectation, but we haven't got enough time to go into that today. Um, this is the chart you should be using. For me, if you use one chart alone, this would take care of most things. It allows you to proactively see how long is it going to take, and also if you've got too many dots on it, that means you've got too many things in progress, and it allows you to make informed decisions based on item age as to what you should be working on as a team. So in summary, how to avoid lying with Agile charts? Well, one, remember metrics enable better conversations, and better charts enable better conversations. So visualizing your data effectively will mean better conversations in and amongst your teams or organization. If you probably haven't guessed by now, avoid using averages. Um, particularly when it comes to forecasting, it's a very flawed approach. Be careful when you're using it to look at trends, like, for example, your cycle time. And always be mindful of those five different ways that charts can lie when it comes to visualizing your data. When you present a metric, think about the different ways it could be lying to you and find ways to improve it based on that. And in closing, just remember this quote from Alberto. A chart shows only what it shows and nothing else. So always be mindful of that when you're visualizing data. And with that, we can go to questions. Thank you very much. That was amazing. And uh, we have a question which is difficult. So please comment, Mateusz. This is a question from Mateusz. If uh, you can add something a bit general, what would you say that is this even possible to represent reality with charts and metrics, or they obfuscate a difficult word just as much as they reveal? Very good question. I think that is the essence of any sort of use of measurement when it comes to Agile teams. They're probably missing a little bit of reality. Like I said, no one, once they're blocked, immediately goes to their Kanban board and tags something as blocked. Human nature is, I'm just going to work on the next thing, the next priority. And therefore, any sort of kind of time, you have to take it with a pinch of salt. So, so long as, like I said, you're not treating it as, this is the fundamental answer, this took seven days exactly, and you're just using it as to, this took seven days, how could we improve the flow of it so it was a little bit quicker, um, but not over-gaming it, over-emphasizing it, so people artificially kind of break work down. I think that's a balance you have to retain. Um, when I started looking at data metrics, I always viewed it as kind of the answer, and I think over time, like the question alludes to, I've understood that actually it's not necessarily the answer, it's just maybe a little bit of an indicator that might help us. Difficult stuff. Difficult. Yeah, practicing my politician, maybe. So, Least maybe a simpler question then. A simpler and popular from Maciek. What tools do you recommend to aggregate and show data? How to extract them from our backlogs? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm a little bit biased because there's tools I've built. Now, they're all free. Don't worry. Um, so over the years, I've got frustrated with the charts that are kind of built into the tools, like Jira and Azure DevOps, and they come out of the box. Um, so I have open source tools that work with Jira or Azure DevOps. Actionable Agile is a great tool, um, but it's paid. And if you really uh, kind of can't get any sort of external tool, use Troy McGuinness's stuff. Troy, all his stuff is spreadsheets. It uses Excel. Hopefully, every organization has Excel. It works for Google Sheets as well, if you're G Suite. Um, but when I started my journey, that's what I started using. I started using Troy's tools as a minimum, because it's as simple as getting your in-progress date, your completed date, chucking that into a template, and then it gives you the charts. Um, so that would be my advice. 
Thank you. And Michal asks, how do you make sure that data you use to simulate probable outcomes is not corrupted? Are there any good practices you can recommend to ensure data quality? So um, I didn't really um, call it out when I was on that slide, but on our version of the, um, of the forecast, it shows you actually the percentage kind of stability or instability of the input data. So I try to kind of coach people around playing around with a range as to what input data they take and seeing what the range of outcomes are. So you might use 12 weeks historical data, and that may give you an answer. But if you have 10 weeks, see what that looks like. If you have six weeks, try what that looks like, because your context could have changed. Um, and I really kind of emphasize the importance of if the stability percentage is too high, then chances are it's a bit of a pointless ask when it comes to forecasting when you're going to be done, because your throughput is all over the place that you may as well just guess. Um, but those are the tools that we use, so looking at the stability of the input data. Yes, and this is connected question from Anonymous. How to convince the team to measure? Often they think that it's important only for a Scrum Master. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'll confess I made this mistake in the past when I've gone in uh, kind of as a Scrum Master with a team saying, let's look at all these metrics and see where we can improve. Um, there has to be a desire from the team to want to do it. So any sort of setting up of metrics, dashboards, etc. The request really has to come from the team. So when we've been rolling out these metrics to teams in ASOS, it's, it's invitation over infliction, right? We're not forcing them to use it. They have to want to use it. Some of the things that we like to do is training based on fictional data. So where there are patterns and anti-patterns in particular charts, and the team can learn in a safe space. And then that might get them curious about their own data, and then they might want to set it up. And if they don't, then it may just be that it's not the right time for them. You can't force it upon them, is what I've learned. Um, I worked in one organization, and they took every single team's JIRA data and put it on a central data platform um, without the teams even having a say-so as to if that could be done or not. And that was, for me, probably the worst example as to how to uh, not get people to buy in. Um, so you, you've just got to kind of stick with it, encourage them, and only if they want to do it should you then start to look at it. Otherwise, it's just going to be a pointless task. And in my case, I can say your tools convinced us to oh, thank you. measure something. And the last question for today, it's from uh, Michał. Some numbers should be shown on a logarithmic chart because of its physical nature. Wasn't case you show? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Some numbers should be shown on logarithmic charts. Yes. Because of its physical nature. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, I'd agree. Um, if you watch Dopesick, you'll find that wasn't the case there. It was too deliberately mislead. OK, thank you very much. We have a few more questions, but I think, Nicolas, you will be available for further questions. So please, uh, thank you very much for this lecture.